All right, this is chapter 11. It is our first chapter of organic chemistry, and we're going to talk all about hydrocarbons. So hydrocarbons are compounds that have hydrogen and carbon in them. And so organic compounds, as an introduction, uh, they are carbon and hydrogen containing compounds. So if you do not have carbon and hydrogen, you're not considered an organic compound. So be very careful because something like carbon dioxide may seem organic because we have a different definition of organic when it comes to produce and those kinds of things. Um, but in organic chemistry, we only talk about carbon and hydrogen compounds. You can also contain uh, other nonmetals like oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, or a halogen. Um, and then you will find organic chemicals in medicine, shampoos. I mean, anything where you've ever read the ingredients list and you think that's a really long name, it's probably an organic uh, compound. When you write the formula of organic compounds, you always write carbon first, then hydrogen, then something else. So, for example, you would write C. Uh, some number of carbons, some number of hydrogens, and then whatever other elements that you would want after that. Organic compounds typically have covalent bonding because we're all dealing with nonmetals. They have low melting and boiling points. So think about why they would have low melting and boiling points and what types of intermolecular forces that would have. That means that their glue is uh, not very strong, so they would have lower lower IMFs. And so I'm talking about London dispersion forces. And there are organic compounds that have hydrogen bonding, um, but a large number of organic compounds wind up having intermolecular forces that are very weak. So when I say lower, I should probably write weaker IMF. This is just typical. Uh, they're not soluble in water, so you should be thinking that they are polar or nonpolar. Well, if they don't dissolve in water, then they must be nonpolar, which is why they have London dispersion forces, right? Uh, and they also undergo combustion. So every combustion reaction we've been doing, we talk about a carbon-hydrogen compound reacting with oxygen in the air. And so that's always been an organic compound. We just haven't really talked about it as such. When you're talking about inorganic compounds, we're talking about sodium chloride, right? So sodium chloride versus propane. Uh, we, inorganic compounds have really high melting and boiling points because an ionic bond is a really, really strong attraction compared to London dispersion forces that propane might have. Um, and so the glue is a lot uh, stronger with uh, ionic compounds. And so you're not going to have those compounds separate into liquids or gases, which is propane exists naturally just as a gas. Um, and then you can't combust most inorganic compounds, and they usually dissolve in water if they're ionic. So here's a table talking about some differences in organic and inorganic compounds. Typically, up to this point in the course, we've been talking about inorganic compounds, and so now we're going to shift gears and talk mostly about organic compounds. So do a quick uh, learning check, pause, and tell me whether or not this is typical of organic or inorganic. All right, so here are your answers. If it has a high melting point, that's inorganic. When I think about a high melting point, think about table salts. If you've ever used table salts um, on food or like, uh, you know, the coarse rock salt on something and you've cooked it, you could probably still feel the crunch of that salt. It didn't melt. But if you were to take sugar and you were to put it in the pan, then it would probably melt. So that's kind of the difference between inorganic and organic. Sugar is an organic compound. Uh, it's not soluble in water. I want you to think about oil. Oil does not dissolve in water, so it's organic. Uh, it has a formula of this. If we see all carbons and hydrogens, typically organic. If you see something that's ionic, it's inorganic. Or something that just doesn't have any carbon and hydrogen, it will be inorganic. It burns easily in air. That's combustion. And so that's organic. And it has covalent bonds. That would be organic. And so when we're talking about the structure of organic compounds, we talk about the carbon-hydrogen interaction. And so the carbon-hydrogen um, uh, bond is nonpolar, uh, and every carbon likes to have four bonds. And you know this, it's a typical bonding pattern for carbon. Saturated hydro um, hydrocarbons contain only single bonds, because if you think about saturated, I want you to think about saturated with hydrogen. This compound has as much hydrogen as it can have. 
um, because every carbon is bonded to four things. It's not bonded to itself versus a carbon that may be double bonded to itself. If I have four bonds around each carbon, I'm limited by the number of hydrogens I can have because I'm taking up one bond with an, uh, an, another bond to a carbon. And so we would call this unsaturated. And so this is where we get saturated and unsaturated fats from. So methane is a saturated hydrocarbon. Uh, it's CH4. That's your first kind of basic hydrocarbon. It's pretty much as basic as you can get. And there's a few different models here. Uh, a model that I would like to uh, focus in on uh, is your ball and stick model. You've seen that before. Uh, the space filling model is probably what you would expect it to really look like in real life. Uh, you're familiar with the Lewis structure and the molecular formula. And, um, and the molecular formula here, this is actually the condensed structural formula, but you can't really tell that with methane. Uh, and But I want you to see this formula here. There's a few things I'm looking at. I'm looking at uh, this wedge. The wedge is coming out of the plane. And so I think about a tetrahedron as a 3D thing. When we draw this uh, wedge dash model, your straight lines are in the plane of the board or in the plane of the screen. Your wedge is coming out of the screen and your dash is going back into the screen. And so that kind of gives us the illusion of three dimensions. You may not see it quite yet, but hopefully we'll draw enough to where you can kind of see that. Here's one more carbon compound. It's a little more complicated. It's ethane. And so here we're increasing the number of car carbons I have. You see this wedge dash showing us the three dimensional uh, format of these tetrahedron structures and then we get what's really the condensed formula here showing the bonds between the high bonds between the carbons and then not really showing those bonds between the carbon hydrogens kind of assuming that you could figure out the bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens but only highlighting the bonds between carbons is that your condensed structural formula we're going to be focusing on building uh these expanded or the normal Lewis also known as Kekulé structures and you're going to be using the condensed structures a lot. So we're going to look at this butane molecule so this is your Kekulé your expanded or your normal Lewis structure for butane. Tell me what the shape of each carbon atom is so like look at the electron groups around each carbon so pause and do that. And so if you're looking at this at the electron groups around each carbon you see four electron groups. Each electron group is attached to something. It doesn't matter what it's attached to, we just know that it's attached to something, there's no lone pairs. So you should think that that is a tetrahedral shape. And if we check all of these carbons, they all have four electron groups around them attached to something. Attached to carbon, attached to hydrogen, doesn't matter. So all of these carbons have a tetrahedral shape. Only if you get double bonds or triple bonds will you change that shape, or if you put in something besides carbon will you change your shape. If you have carbon in a saturated hydrocarbon, then you will all have tetrahedrons there. And so you have been, oh no, my picture is all messed up, it's fine. Um, you have been looking at hopefully starting to memorize uh, some of the organic compound functional groups. One is the alkane. The alkane is uh, a large number of carbon compounds. It's just the simplest form of organic compounds. And so an alkane is only single bonds. So if you have only single bonds, you're some version of an alkane. Uh, we can form a continuous chain of carbon atoms. Um, and we use this IUPAC, this international naming system for them. We've been using the IUPAC, the international naming system, thus far, and we will continue to use that. You'll also find a lot of common names. I don't want you to worry about the common names. I only want you to use the IUPAC names because the common names can just sometimes add a little more frustration to your learnings. Uh, it's a little more than you probably need. Um, now, if you go into the field and you're dealing with something, uh, you may need to know a common name for it because that's what your colleagues will call it. But we're going to learn the international naming system because common names kind of 
don't really make a lot of sense. Um, and the international naming system has like step-by-step -step procedures and how to name something. And so we're going to use that. Uh, alkanes all end in ain. So when you're naming them and you see something end in ain, that's an alkane. Um, and then we use Greek prefixes to name the carbon chains with uh, five or more carbon atoms. So we use pent, um, hex, hept. Uh, those great prefixes, but we use different prefixes to name things between one and four carbons. And so looking here, here are the name of the first ten alkanes. If we look at your prefixes, you have meth for one, eth for two, prop for three, but, not but, but for four, and then you have your same prefixes that you know from your covalent compounds from five to ten. Um, and you notice that all of our endings here are anes because these are all alkanes. So propane, butane, methane, ethane, um, hexane, those are all alkanes. Here are your molecular formulas. You can see the molecular formula is just counting how many hydrogens and carbons that you have. And then you have the condensed structural formulas showing you the bonds between the carbons, but not the bonds between the hydrogens. And then we have something called a line angle formula. The line angle formula works a little, a little like this. Uh, so line integral formula, every end and every bend is a carbon. And so I want you to think about every end and bend as a carbon. How many carbons for this top one? There are two carbons. So for two carbons, you would name this eth. And those carbons are held together with a single bond, so we would name it ethane. And so two carbons is an ethane. Uh, the next one down, one, two, three carbons, naming every end and bend. And so all single bonds, and I will call this propane. When I'm first doing these with you guys, when I'm first learning them, um, I will always kind of put dots where every carbon should be. And then again, kind of like the structural, the condensed formula, we're assuming that you can put together how many hydrogens there would be. And so looking at uh, this one here with the four carbons, which would be butane, if each carbon needs to have four lines around it, we could kind of draw some little proxy lines. So if this carbon right here has, this carbon here has one line already, how many lines does it need to get to four? Well, it needs three more. So how many hydrogens are hanging off this carbon here? There are three hydrogens hanging off that carbon. So that last carbon you can see here is CH3. And so here's another example of a condensed structural formula. It's attached hydrogen atoms are kind of written as a group. Um, and we'll get into branching and all that kind of stuff a little later. But this is uh, butane because I have one, two, three, four carbons here. And so here's how you can translate condensed to expanded and expanded to condensed. Expanded, also known as Lewis structures, uh, your normal Lewis structures. And so if you have CH3 we would write CH3 and we would keep this bond the same. If you had a carbon that's kind of in the middle of, of a chain, then you would have two H's attached to that carbon. So you'd write it CH2 with bonds on either side. Uh, so a skeletal formula, and this is your line angle formula, uh, every end and every bend, we count those. So this is just summing up that we can represent alkanes in all of those ways. And so just being clear about structural formulas. So if I wanted to draw uh, a just straight butane, which is four carbons, because but is for four, um, attached in a single line, um, and then it has as many hydrogens as you can fit around it, because it's an ane, so it's all single bonds, so it's um, saturated. You could draw it in a straight line. Okay, so look in your condensed formula. You could draw it in a straight line. Uh, you could also draw it straight up and down, so vertical or horizontal. And I could bend it if I want to as well. But if you look at how long your, your main chain is, the main chain of carbons, that is the amount of carbons you can connect without picking up your finger. You've got one, two, three, four. Isn't that butane for four in single bonds for aim? Yes, so four single bonds. One, two, three, four. Even if I bend it like this, one, two, three, four. This is not an ethane with other stuff hanging off. This is one long chain. You can bend this chain 
any way you want and it's still the longest chain is four, we call it a butane. And again, my line angle formulas, I can start them going up or I can start them going down and it actually doesn't matter. So for this structural formula, give me the molecular formula, so like how many carbons and hydrogens, so like C number, H number, with the subscripts, uh, the condensed structural formula, and the compound name. So pause and give me that. All right, so here is your molecular formula. So for the carbons, I'll count one, two, three, four, five. And so I say C5. And then for my hydrogens, I'll count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I get a 12 here. My condensed structural formula, we're going to break down every carbon and see how many H's it has attached that go with it. So with carbon number 1 here, I have 3 H's, so CH3. Carbon number 2, I have 2 H's, CH2. Carbon number 3, 2 H's, CH2. Carbon number 4, 2 H's, CH2. And carbon number 5. 2H's CH3. Because I have five carbons, I know it's pent. And because it's all single bonds, I know it is ane. Write the condensed structural formulas for ethane and heptane. So pause and do that. You should get these as your condensed structural formulas. Eth meaning two carbons. And so I have two carbons. And then I fill it up with hydrogens. And then heptane, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in all single bonds. If you are in a longer chain, your interiors will always be CH2s for alkanes and your exteriors will be CH3s because that's just how it has to work. Um, you can re reference this to see that if I have four bonds and I'm in the middle, I have to be bonded to two carbons, so I only have room for two hydrogens. So cycloalkanes are one more way you can have an alkane. And if you had couldn't guess, cyclo means cyclical or circle. And so you are going to connect uh, all of the carbons in a ring. So if you have propane here with three carbons, this would be your condensed structural formula. Maybe we gave it a little angle here. Now, if you were to connect these two carbons with a single bond, you lose some hydrogens because uh, now this carbon's bond that used to be to a hydrogen um, is bonded to a carbon. And so you would have fewer hydrogen atoms in cyclical uh, compounds. Um, to name a cycloalkane, you just put the word cyclo in front of it. So propane becomes cyclopropane. So here are some cycloalkanes. You can see their ball and stick models, they're condensed, and then their lines actually will make the shape that you're looking at. So like hexane here makes the shape of a hexagon, pentane makes the shape of a pentagon. Go ahead and practice giving the name for each of these compounds. All right, so if you're looking here, we've got eight carbon atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Every end in a bend is a carbon, so this is oct, and the ane, because it's all single bonds. For this one, we've got cycle, one, two, three, four, five, so we're going to say cyclopentane. It's got five carbons, all single bonds. Let's try one more time naming these four. Why don't you make sure that you're pausing and you're actually doing the work, so active learning here, practicing, and then um, only moving forward after you've got your own guess. So for A, we have butane. We've got four carbons here. Uh, B, we've got cyclopropane. We've got three carbons in a cycle, in a cyclical, in a ring. Octane for eight carbons. Cyclohexane, six carbons in a circle, in a ring. Now let's say we wanted to make our alkanes a little more complicated. They're not always just going to be carbons straight up in a line together. Sometimes they're going to have substituents. So a substituent is called a side group um, or a branch substituent. I call it a side chain. So you can have a side chain, you can have a main chain. So your side chain is whatever is not in your your longest chain. So looking at these examples here, if you look here, you've got one, two, three, four uh, carbons in your one chain that you can, you know, put your pen down and you can count one, two, three, four without breaking it. Now, if you're looking at this one, 
Um, if I can try to find my longest chain, I'll start here, one, two, and go up, maybe three. Okay, well now I've broken this. I cannot count all four of them without breaking the chain. And so I have a main chain, which should always be your longest chain, and then you have a substituent or a, a side chain. So let's figure out which is our longest chain. We've got one, two, three, or one, two, three, or one, two, three. Any of these combinations can be your uh, your main chain. And I always will put a ring on it, my main chain, put a circle around that, and then I'll put a little cuff around my side chain just so that I can be sure which one is which. Because it is important in the naming of it, which one you decided is your main, your longest possible chain, and which one is going to be your substituent or your side chain. These are called structural isomers, or constitutional isomers. Same thing. Uh, they have the same number of hydrogens and carbons, but they have different um, structures, and therefore they have different names. Um, this is C4H10 both ways, but it's not, they're not both butane. One of them is going to be named a little different, different. So they have different names. And you can't tell by looking at C4H10 um, exactly which one uh, you're, you're meaning. So you have to be really careful with organic compounds and actually naming what it is you want uh, because this is different than this. So they're isomers because they have the same, uh, they have the same molecular formula, so C10, C4H10, but they have different structures. So we're going to draw some possible structures of pentane. So how, think of how many different ways we can draw pentane, and they actually be different. So looking at this, I'm going to do the uh, zigzag, the line angle, because it's faster. Um, you're more than welcome to try with the full-on C's and H's and the full structure expanded if you want. I think the lines are a lot, uh, a lot easier to count all my carbons, because the hydrogens really don't matter. If we know we're dealing with ane, it's going to have uh, all, all single bonds. And so if I'm trying to find how many different ways I could put five carbons and 12 hydrogens together. Um, so starting with just all five carbons connected in one line and we can I mean, we, we can draw it here i'll draw the this one in the, so five carbons and then each of them has a hydrogen i'm not going to draw all the h's we're just going to pretend like those are h's if you want to you can draw all the h's uh, i always like to make sure that I've got something different before I put in all the work and then have to erase it. So let's just check this really quick. I have my longest chain, one, two, three, four, five. My longest chain is five. So this is pentane. Okay, so this is one of them. Now let's draw another one. Now to draw this, uh, maybe you don't draw this one in your notes. Um, what if I did this? Well, now my longest carbon chain is three, right? No, my longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, is still five. These two are the same thing. You just took this and bent it down. And that doesn't mean that they're different, and they need to have different structures to be a structural isomer. And so I have to actually do something different than the way it currently is, just bend it a little bit. Uh, the way to do that is to cut off an edge. So let's say we cut off this carbon and reattach it to the middle. So let's say, uh, let's start with a shorter long chain. So I start with four. I know it's going to be different because now it's not a pentane, now it's a butane. And I have a carbon that I cut off. Uh, let's put it in the middle. Now I have an option. I can put it here, or I can put it here. Now if I put it here, it just becomes a bended pentane. Put it here, comes a bended pentane. So I have to put it on one of these carbons. I have a choice. So let's stick it here. So this is on uh, this carbon, and then this is not part of my main chain. This is actually this one, same one that I broke off. I'm placing it here. So my longest chain here, one, two, three, four, is a butane, and it has a side chain on it. And so you will do this until you run out of new things. Um, So here are the three different ways you can build pentane. 
uh, as a structural isomer. You can make 2-butane, so a butane with a group hanging off of carbon 2. Now be careful because if you did this, these two are the same. They're just flipped around. Uh, we'll talk about numbering carbons in a minute. And then this one, the longest carbon chain, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, is 3. So this is a propane with some side chains hanging off of it. So those are your three different ways you can draw pentane, or, uh, or five carbons. And so if we have the side chains, we have to give them names. Uh, if it's a carbon atom side chain, it's called an alkyl group, and we give it an ol ending. For example, methyl is for one. One carbon in my side chain. Uh, ethyl two carbons in my side chain. Propyl, three carbons in my side chain. You get the gist. And then you have a halo substituent as a halogen atom. So if you've got a fluorine attached, you would just call it fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iodo, depending on which halogen it is. And so here are some, uh, some names and some common substituents. So we've got methyl, ethyl, propyl. Uh, don't worry about isopropyl, but it is interesting to know what isopropyl is because you probably have isopropyl alcohol in your cabinet at home. Um, you've got butyl and isobutyl. Again, you don't need to know the isos. Those are common names. Fluoro, chloro, bromo, and iodo. All right, let's try this one. Now, first, I want you to build from the back. Uh, so you're going to start with the ending. Is the ending ane? or something else. And we haven't learned anything else yet, so the ending is obviously ain. Let's just give a quick check. Are they all single bonds? Yes, I see no double bonds or triple bonds. And no uh, uh, other special groups like alcohols. So I'm going to start with the ending as ain. So I know that that is an ain. Now let's count my longest carbon chain. We have to count all options of carbon chain. So 1, 2, 3, 4... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 1, 2, 3, 4. Always, always count forward and backward and count any direction to see which one your longest chain was. Now you remember we're counting here 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The 5 is the longest carbon chain. Go ahead once you find your longest chain and put a ring on it. That's your main chain. And so my main chain is 5, so we're a pentane. And now we got some side chains, so we need to address them. My side chain here, I have one side chain here, and I have a side chain right here. Now hydrogens don't count as side chains, they're just normal parts of the main chain. And so we have to decide uh, which of these side chains is going to get the lowest number. Um, let's see if we have it here. Oh. You always want to give your um, your substituents the lowest number possible. So, for example, let's count some carbons. I have two options for counting. I can start from counting on the left. I can start from counting on the right. So I can say that this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or we can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, you can look and see if your chloro and your, what is this one called? Let's just write these names out. Uh, this one is called chloro, and this one is called methyl. I like to write the names out here just to make sure that I'm remembering how to name my side chains. I can either have my chloro on 2 and my methyl on 3, or I can have my methyl on 3 and my chloro on 4. Your lowest number possible uh, means higher priority, and so you want your side chains to have as high priority as possible, so the 2-3 option is better than the 3-4 option, right? We also are going to put them in the name in alphabetical order. So who comes first? Chloro is going to come first. And so when we're building, you may want to actually start kind of expanding out a little bit. We'll put our chloro first. So we are going to build kind of from the back. You can absolutely put the methyl next if you want to, but I kind of like to think about it as start from the back and then put my side chains in. So I'm leaving some space for the methyl. And so I'm going to say chloro. Now, where is my chloro? It's on carbon 2. You have to tell me where it is. Because you can have chlorine hanging off carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon You've got to tell me where it is. And we're choosing carbon 2. We're choosing 
to number from left to right because our other option is 3 and 4, and 2 and 3 is much better. So 2 chloro is hanging off of carbon 2, and then where's my, my methyl is hanging off of carbon 3. And so I'll write three chloro, 2 chloro, 3 methyl pentane. That is the name of this thing. Uh, you want to put your substituents in alphabetical order and then put the number right before it. So it's kind of like asking yourself, if we're going backwards, okay, we have uh, all single bonds. How many carbons in my main chain? Five carbons in my main chain. Well, I have a methyl group. Where's that methyl group? Carbon three. I also got a chloro group. Where's that chloro group? Carbon two. So you're kind of answering your own questions about where everything is as you go. When you're talking about a cycloalkane, you need to decide whether or not you're going to number it from the left or right, so clockwise or counterclockwise, but it's the same idea. Lowest numbers are better numbers. Um, you do not need to put a number if you only have one thing, because you think about this as kind of rotating, and this is always going to be carbon number one if we're, if we're kind of measuring or numbering things, and so you would just say, and there's an ethyl hanging off of a cyclohexane, and you're not going to say one ethyl or two ethyl because I'm always going to number this carbon one, and I could rotate this thing around, um, and it would be exactly the same. So it would just be ethyl. The same goes for like a methyl propane. It's just it's always going to be hanging off of the same carbon no matter what. And so when you're drawing carbon, drawing structures given the names, uh, kind of think about it like a puzzle you're trying to solve. So we'll start at the end. Uh, we've got anes, which means we have all single bonds. We have hept, which means we have a seven carbon chain in our longest chain. And so let's draw that. So I've got seven carbons hanging off of my laundry in the same colors that they have here. Seven carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in my longest chain. Okay, counting ends and bends. And then I have uh, some methyl action. Now, di means two, so I have two methyls. Where are they? Carbon two and carbon three. Now, when I'm drawing this structure, I can start counting from wherever I want. I like to count right, left to right. And so I'm going to say this is carbon, I'm going to say this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so my methyls are hanging off of carbons two and three, so I'm going to stick a methyl here, and stick a methyl here, that means there's two methyls. Now, dimethyl is not the same as ethyl. Ethyl would be like two kinks in a chain. Uh, methyl is just one little uh, dot hanging off. I also have a chlorine group. So my chlorine is on carbon one. So in carbon one, I'm gonna put a little bond to a Cl. Do not leave it blank because then it becomes a methyl. Well, it doesn't become a methyl, it becomes an octane. But you will draw a little line and put a CL when you're putting like a group like that on. So here's a condensed structure. I was drawing for you the line angle um, structure, but you can also look at the condensed structure here of that same compound. I give me a condensed and line angle for 3 bromo 1 chlorobutane. So pause and try it. All right, so let's do this. Let's start from the end and get a butane. So I like to start with line angle. It makes more sense to me, but you can start with condensed if you want to. I have four carbons in a long chain. So one, two, three, four carbons in a long chain. Now I got some side chains going on. I got a chlorine hanging off of which carbon? Carbon number one. Well, I'm going to say this is carbon one, two, three, four. So hanging off of carbon one, I got a chlorine. I also have a bromo. So my bromine is hanging off of carbon number three. Now, once you start numbering one way, you can't just say, oh, well, I'm going to number the other way now. You have to number in the same direction every time. So if this is one, this has to be three. And that's where my BR, my bromine, is hanging off. And so now we can try our condensed structural formula. So taking a look at carbon number one. Carbon number one has how many H's hanging off? Do a little orange here. So carbon number one has one, two bonds. So it needs two more bonds. We got boop, boop, two H's. So CH2, we also have, got, have that CL here, so let's just put that CL in there. And now we have uh, a bond to another carbon, that's carbon number two. So carbon number two has how many H's uh, hanging off of it, because it has two bonds already. It has 
two H's, so H2. And it doesn't really have any other groups hanging off of it, so we can just continue on to carbon number three. Carbon number three has one, two, three bonds, so it needs one more to have its octet, so one H. And then you got a bromine hanging off of this one. Oop, that's a purple one. Oh no. And so we're going to put our BR here, and then we have a bond to carbon number four. Carbon number four only has one bond, so it needs three hydrogens to make up the rest of its octet. And so this would be your condensed structural formula for 3-bromo-1-chlorobutane. We'll put the 3-bromo in front because the bromine is a B, and so that's alphabetical order. And so this is just taking you through the whole thing. And you could do the you can do the CLs and BRs hanging off the bottom like this, or you can do them inside, it doesn't matter. So name each of the following alkanes. So pause and give me a name for these. Alright, so let's look for our main chains first. You gotta look for your main chain. Uh, I got here one, two, three, four, five. And there's no other options. So here's my main chain. Put a ring on it. And then let's name it. So this is going to be all single bonds. How many carbons were there? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So this is a pentane. And do you have any side chains? I got one side chain here. This one side chain is called chloro. What carbon is it hanging off of? Now I got some options. I can set the carbons hanging off of one, or chlorine's hanging off of one, two, three, four, five, four. Or I can count from le uh, right to left. One, two, three, four, five. Counting this way gives me, uh, counting this direction, gives me a lower number. So I'm going to call this 2-chloro-pentane. I'm not going to call this 4-chloro. Don't, don't let your side chain uh, hear you calling them with a lower number, which means a lower, or a higher number, which means lower priority. You want the lower possible number, meaning higher priority, um, given to that, to that side chain. All right, for this one, now we got to count our main chain. This one's a little more complicated. So we have options for main chain. we got 1, 2, 3. We got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So it doesn't matter how we count this or this in the main chain, we still have five. So let's circle our main chain. Um, go crazy, do this one. Doesn't matter, as long as it's five. So I got five in my main chain. Again, this is going to be a pentane. And I got some side chains hanging out here. My side chains are here and here. And both of these side chains have one end, so they are methyls. If I have two methyls, I gotta say dimethyl. Where are my methyls? Where are my methyls? They can either be on carbon one, two, three, four, five. They can be on carbon three and four. Or we can be on carbons two and three. So three, four, two, three. 2, 3 is going to win. Now, if you're going to say dimethyl, every methyl gets their own number. So we got to write 2, 3, dimethyl. What if my methyls are on the same carbon? Then you write 2, 2 or 3, 3. Every group gets its own number. And this is taking you through the whole thing. They've identified their main chain as this one. I did this one. It doesn't matter as if it's the same same name here. All right, so now we looked at some writing and naming alkanes. What are some properties of alkanes? So alkanes are waxy. Um, they can also be, so going to be solids, liquids, or gases, depending on how many carbons they have. Alkanes with one to four carbons are gases. So we got methane, ethane, propane, butane. So your butane uh, lighter is your heaviest gas. Uh, it's really easy to make a liquid, which is why the lighter, the butane lighter, has liquid butane in it because you put it under a little bit of pressure, and it becomes a liquid pretty easily. So it's your heaviest uh, gas at room temperature. As soon as you open that uh, lighter up, it will come out as a gas, and you have to strike a little flint in the lighter to get it to go, uh, to get it to combust. Um, and then you have from five to eight, so pentane to oxane. Octane is going to be your liquids. Think of octanes and the gasoline, and gasoline is a liquid. So you've got pentane to octane as your liquids. 
And then anything above 9 is going to be um, liquids with higher boiling points. Uh, and then 18 or more is going to be your waxy solids, your paraffins. If you've ever used paraffin wax, you petroleum jelly, Vaseline, those guys. Um, so the difference between your octanes, if these are going to be volatile, right? Uh, volatile means they turn into gases pretty easily. When you get gasoline at the pump, you probably can smell it, right? So that's octane being this volatile liquid. So they're right on that border of like liquid and gas. Um, they really like to, they can also easily be turned into gas at very low temperatures. Um, and so they're very useful at, as fuels. Then you've got your uh, seven to, sorry, uh, nine to 17 motor oils, mineral oil, kerosenes, and those are a little higher boiling points. So it takes a little more energy to combust them because they have more carbons going on, um, more bonds to break. And then, uh, of course, you have anything 18 or more is going to be a solid at room temperature. Uh, you know this already about organic compounds and alkanes are like your typical organic compounds. We're insoluble in water, nonpolar, typically less dense in water. I want you to think about an oil spill, how it floats on top of water. Um, flammable, um, and then found in oil. Alkanes have some reactions that they do. They do combustion reactions. You already know about combustion reactions, and so make sure you can balance those. They give off a lot of energy. So if you want to pause really quick and write a balanced chemical equation for a complete combustion of propane, remember that combustion reactions are the carbon-hydrogen reacting with oxygen gas to make carbon dioxide and water. And so here they're taking you through all the steps, but the very bottom one is the one that you should look at for your final answer. All right, so we're going to talk about alkenes and alkynes. An alkene is a uh, double bond and an alkyne is a triple bond so ethene which is the common name of acetylene is used in welding so I can remember alkenes as a double bond because I think about a lowercase e as having two like a double bond no that's a stretch and alkynes is having this Y with one, two, three lines, so it's a triple bond. Um, they are called unsaturated because they do not have, whoops, sorry about that, they are unsaturated because they do not have all the hydrogen atoms. Those bonds that could go to hydrogen are now going to double and triple bond with the other carbons. They can react with hydrogen to increase the number of hydrogen atoms and become alkanes, so we can react with them. And so looking at alkenes, identifying them, you'll see double bonds. Um, alkynes, you'll see triple bonds. If you look at the uh, carbon arrangement here, this is going to be that 120. This is your trigonal planar. And then you have a linear shape here around your, trip, uh, around your uh, triple bond. So trigonal planar arrangement around your double bond and a triple bond is going to give you a linear. Ethene or ethylene. I have information about that. So here are my alkynes. We've got the linear arrangement there. So take a quick uh, pause. Tell me if it's an alkene or an alkyne. All right, so looking at this one, you should see one double bond here. This is an alkene. And in here, you should see a triple bond. There is a carbon here and a carbon here. This is your alkyne. So if we're naming these, uh, we're going to use this ending. So for all alkanes, we used an ane ending. For alkanes, we're going to use an ene ending. And for alkynes, we're going to use an ine ending. Then you also are sometimes going to have to tell me where the double bond or where the triple bond is because it's got lots of possibilities. Now for propane, propene, and propine, and ethane, ethene, and ethine, there's only one place the bond can be, and it's always on carbon number one. So if you're looking at ethane and ethene and ethine, we have carbons here. There's only two carbons. Only one place the bond can be. 
You got propane though. If you put your bond here, it's going to be between carbon one and two. If you put your carbon bond here, it'll be between carbon one and two because again, we're na we're numbering in either direction. Well, if you have your bonds in places where it might be a little less uh, straightforward as to where the bonds are, you have to tell me. So go ahead and pause and see if you can use what we learned from the last little bit to tell me where these uh, important bonds are. So we're going to go through these steps. First, we're going to name the longest carbon chain. And so for part A, our longest carbon chain is five atoms. So it's a pent, but it's not an ane anymore. It's an ene because it's got a double bond. And for part B, you've got a hex, which is your longest carbon chain. Remember, this is a carbon, and this is a carbon on either side. We don't really have an end or a bend because they have a linear shape. And this is an ion because it's got a triple bond. Now, the next thing you have to do before you do anything else is you've got to tell me where the bond is. So if you have something special, right before the something special comes the number where it is. So if you cannot just say pentene, because I do not know where that bond is, because there are lots of different place, places in five carbons to show me that bond. So you have to say this is in two pentene. You always give your most important functional group, which is the one that gets the last name, that's the most important one, and it always gets the lower number, regardless of any other side chains. Okay. And so your double bond gets the lowest number possible. And here we're numbering left to right for A. And for B, we're numbering right to left because that gives us the lowest number. And then you can go about naming all of your side chains like we've done before. So A will be 4-methyl. And there are no substituents in B. No side chains. If you got a cycloalkene, just put the word in front of it. Um, and you always are going to have your... Uh, double bond or your triple bond uh, or your double bond start at carbon one. Um, so you don't have to tell me ever where that is again because we can rotate that around. So give a quick pause and name these. So you should get cyclohexene. Does again because we're constantly rotating this, you don't have to tell me where it is. And 3 3 dimethyl cyclopentene because on carbon three I have two methyls and I have to say dimethyl. Each methyl gets their own number. And you want to you want to number either clockwise or counterclockwise and so your side chain gets the lowest number. Like I could call this one or I could call this one and I could go this way, but that would be one, two, three, four, five. This would be carbon five. And so you don't want that for your side chain. So you'll pick which direction to write your numbers in so that everything gets lower numbers possible. If we've got double bonds, we also have cis-trans isomers. And so cis-trans isomers are going to be a name we put in front of everything to tell you, okay, if the double bonds, uh, they actually can't rotate. And so if you're kind of looking at this hand model here, uh, if you're cis, I think about your double bonds and your thumbs on the same side, cis meaning same, trans meaning different. And so your thumbs are on different sides. Um, I'll build a, a, a double bond if we get into the lab with a model. You'll see that you cannot, you can rotate around a single bond, but we can't rotate around a double bond. And so it's stuck in whatever way it is. And so you've got to tell me which way it is. And so your thumbs are your ma the rest of the, the, car the compound not the hydrogen group. So this is like the rest of the compound, the more important parts of the compound, either on the same side, cis, or the opposite side, trans. So this here is talking about the rotation. It's in a fixed position. So here's your chlorine, one, two, dichloroethane. So ethene has a double bond. Um, if it's ethene, you don't have to tell me where it is. It's only, can be, there's only two carbons. So we've got two carbons, a double bond between them. I have two chlorines. Where are they? They're on carbon one and two. And then it's cis, meaning the important groups are on the same side. And then this one has the same name, except it's trans because they're on the opposite side. They have different chemical and physical properties. And so make sure you're t naming cis and trans if you ever have a double bond. So you can see here, if we don't have maybe chlorines, we've got other groups. Uh, if this is butene, uh, you've got, where's your double bond? It's on carbon two. Okay, so I've got a double bond right here on carbon two. This one, the rest of the butene, the important parts, carbon being more important than the hydrogens, are on the same side versus this one, they're on opposite sides, they're trans. Um, and so there are cis and trans compounds that make up pheromones. Feel free to read about that. And 
so when you're naming them, you just put cis and trans in front of the name as if you would name it um, any, any other way. You just write cis and trans. So go ahead and pause and give me names for these. Okay, so you're checking your work here, making sure you have the correct names. Um, the important, more important groups for this are going to be the chlorines as our substituent groups. So those are going to be the ones that are cis. These are also important groups, but they're also cis. This is the same. This is the same. And if I'm looking here, though, um, my uh, groups are trans, so they're opposite each other. And then here, the hydrogen groups don't really count, um, but we're looking at this trans configuration here. So now we're going to talk uh, at the very end of this, and hopefully I'm going to get through this um, in about 10 more minutes, the addition reactions. Uh, when we're talking about organic chemistry reactions, you may see a lot of videos that show you mechanisms. You guys don't have to know about mechanisms, but you do have to know the products of certain reactions. And so if we are um, learning uh, about a certain reaction, you may find videos that are way more detailed than you need. Um, just make sure you can do the problem sets and the practice exams. So uh, one addition reaction is called uh, hydrogenation. So we can convert, convert double bonds into um, saturated fats. So saturated would mean that it all has all single bonds, right? And so saturated fats are more solid products versus um, unsaturated fats like olive oil, vegetable oil. Those would be liquids. And so in addition reactions, you have two tons of reactions you could do with alkenes. You can do hydrogenation, which is adding hydrogen, or you can do hydration, which is adding water. If you do hydrogenation, you need a catalyst of a, a particular metal, platinum, nickel, or palladium, PD, uh, and you make an alkane. You just add more hydrogens. You totally saturate it into an alkane. If you do a hydration, you add uh, water to it, and you have to use a strong acid as a catalyst, and you make an alcohol because we're trying to get that OH group connected. And so you should know an alcohol. You should th be thinking that this means that there's an OH group connected to it because you're memorizing that. So here's hydrogenation, uh, what it looks like on either side. Just imagine that these, uh, right now these carbons, they have these four bonds around them, but these, uh, this double bond is taking up some of those bonds. And so if we break apart that double bond, right, that we get spaces for more hydrogens to be apart. And so if you are adding hydrogen to an alkene, that is hydrogenation. And I want you to think hydrogenation, saturation. So we're totally saturating it. So turn your alkene into an alkane. In order to do that, you must have a catalyst to speed up that reaction because it happens way too slow. So go ahead and write an equation for the hydrogenation of one butene using a platinum catalyst. So pause and write that out. And so here's how you'll write this. Uh, one butene. Um, this is the condensed structural formula here. You see you've got your double bond. Your double bond is going to now go away and it's going to turn into only single bonds. And we have hydrogen uh, um, uh, molecule as a reactant here. And uh, platinum is over the arrow or should be more over the arrow. If we're hydrogenating oils, so here's uh, one of the unsaturated oils. You get this kind of weird kink in the in the oil structure. If you were to get rid of that, you would be creating um, just like getting rid of this weird flat line, and and so you would have this more uh, the structure that's more easily fit um, over other structures of itself. And we'll talk about the um, London dispersions of that probably in class. And so now this is going to be a solid uh, room temperature because it has uh, better London dispersion forces like this because everything fits better like a puzzle versus here when you get any sort of kinks, it doesn't really fit as well. So give me products for each of the following here. Sorry, this should be double bond here. This should be H2. And this is the platinum catalyst. And so totally just break apart those double bonds and see if you can draw the products. So here we should get uh, uh, one, two, three, four carbons. So now we have butene. We turn it into butane. And then here you have cyclopentene turning it into cyclopentane. For hydration, uh, 
you're going to have an alkene reacting with water. And I want you to think about water as HOH. So we've done that a few times, thinking about water like that. But you can really think about water as HOH here. A hydrogen atom uh, f from water forms a bond with a carbon atom with the more hydrogens. Okay. So imagine that you're hydrogen. And you're going to go to the carbon that has more of you already. Because it like knows how to handle those hydrogens. So that's really important. So the hydrogen goes with the carbon that has more hydrogen, okay? The hydroxide, the OH, the hydroxyl group, forms a bond with the second carbon, the one with fewer hydrogen. So the hydroxyl is going to go with the carbon with fewer hydrogens. And we're catalyzed here by a strong acid. So you need to think about H+, hydronium, any strong acid you can use as a catalyst here. So if I have an alkene, um, both of these carbons are the same number of hydrogens. This is two hydrogens, this is two hydrogens, so it doesn't matter where your H and OH goes, it's the same. But you made an alcohol now because you have an OH attached to one of these. Um, same thing here. Uh, we have our OH attached. It doesn't matter because they're both uh, two, two hydrogens. So this is the same thing. Why does it say alkene? Sorry. So let's predict the product here. So here's our double bond. Um, I know I'm going to have an H on one of these carbons and an OH on the other carbon because this is a hydrolysis adding water. Um, this carbon, how many H's does it have? Let's hide them. This is two H, uh, one H for this carbon, and this carbon has two H's. So the one with more H's is going to get the hydrogen. The one with less H's is going to get the hydroxyl. This is something called Markovnikov's rule. And I'm not sure if your book mentions Markovnikov's rule, but you may hear it in videos, and so I want you to know what that means. It just means, hey, my hydrogens are going to go in like-minded company. Um, so what I get here is going to be CH3, CH2, CH2. 2 because the CH1 turns into CH2 and then I'm going to get C oh I'm sorry hold on oops that's wrong Whoa. I'm going to get CH with an OH hanging off and then I'm going to get CH3 pardon me so CH2 is going to turn into 3 this CH is going to get the OH because it's the one with the least amount of hydrogens and so we're going to have this as our product And lastly, we're going to be talking about aromatic compounds. Aromatic compounds are things that smell, right? We get aromas from them. And aromatic compounds are just this uh, resonating compound. And so resonant structure, if you remember, is if I have a double bond, but it doesn't matter where I put it, I show you all possibilities, right? And so this very, very, very special substance, it's very special and important, it's just called a benzene. And we will use the common name for this. We will not use one, three, five, uh, tri, was it, tri, pentene. Um, we don't even call it that, um, obviously, because I'm struggling with it. Uh, we just call it benzene. And so your uh, double bonds are alternating. So you got a single bond. A double bond, a single bond, a double bond, a single bond, a double bond, and each carbon only has one hydrogen, so we get C6H6 is our formula here. Benzene is aromatic. That means that it gives off an aroma. Um, also means that it has this resonance between its double bonds. It's uh, flat. Um, it's got a really special structure, um, but it's, it's, well, maybe not flat. Uh, we can draw it as a flat ring structure. Um, you get uh, these alternating double bonds. You've got a cyclical structure. And we can shorten all of this, right? So we can show this resonance here, as this is your resonance. We can show this resonance, or we just draw this circle in the middle, meaning that the electrons are kind of doing this little dance all around the inside, they're ringing around the rosy, and they're doing this little uh, moving around. And so we say we have double bond character on pretty much all of these carbon-carbon bonds, and so we use this ring around the center to indicate that that's happening instead of showing all the resonance all the time.
So benzene has some derivatives. So we've got a methyl group hanging off of it, which is called toluene. Okay. And you've got an NH2 hanging off of it. We call that aniline. And then you've got a hydroxyl group hanging off of it. We call that a phenol. If you have two or more substituents, the benzene ring is numbered to give lowest number. Again, we always use lowest number possible. So you'll treat benzenes like you would any other cyclical things. When you have a, a benzene derivative like toluene, phenol, or aniline, if it has substituents, the carbon attached to the methyl hydroxyl with the amine, the NH3 group, is always carbon 1. And so because it gets its own name, it's more special than any other side chain, so it always gets to be 1. And then you just name everything else alphabetically in lowest numbers that you can possibly make it. Toluene is uh, used in TNT, tri-nitro-toluene. So how many nitro groups are there? Three, right? So here it is, TNT. Another one, um, you can see benzene and acetaminophen, aspirin, and vanillin. All right, last little one. Give me a quick learning check here. So pause and ABC, select the right name for this. All right, so here's your solution. We have chlorobenzene, benzene with a chlorine group. That chlorine group is always going to be one. You don't have to tell me what number it is. And then for C, you do have to tell me some numbers here because um, you can number them one, two, three, which is obviously the answer. Um, or we can number them uh, one, two, three, four, five. And so three, th one, three is better than three, five, uh, one, five. And so you'll number them in the clockwise direction. There are two methyls, so we say dimethyl, and then the root uh, base is benzene. And here's a great uh, flow chart for you at the end. Uh, you may want to, at this point in the text, start kind of maybe printing out these end of chapter flow charts and have them as kind of like the beginning and the end of your chapter notes because they are very, very, very helpful in organizing your thoughts as we get more and more crazy with organic compounds.